Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to um, uh, the latest TBI Talks webinar. My name is Ian Mulhern. I'm the Executive Director for UK Policy here at the Tony Blair Institute. And it's great to have you all with us today to talk uh, about tax uh, under the banner of taxing times, when and where should taxes rise? Now, a few months back in the spring, uh, we produced a paper looking at some different scenarios for the path of the public finances uh, in the wake of uh, different COVID possible outcomes for the rest of the year. Uh, and, and more recently, the OBR has, has produced its assessment where its central projection suggested that we may need to rise, raise something like uh, 60 billion in terms of taxes or spending cuts in order to uh, uh, close the, the structural deficit that will be left in the wake of uh, COVID. But is the tax system up to this challenge? Now, since 2008, uh, probably, when money's been tightened uh, and we've been looking to close a yawning deficit, uh, decisions about the tax system and, and, and benefits as well have often been uh, tactical ones that have left the system more complicated, perhaps less fair, uh, and uh, with more anomalies in it if you look at anything from, from pensions to, to uh, income tax rates and savings taxation, uh, ch the child benefit uh, rules for tapering that. There are all sorts of strange anomalies around uh, which um, are the result of this accretion of tactical uh, decisions. So the question really as we start the 2020s is can we take a more strategic view of how to approach uh, uh, the, the tax challenge or the fiscal consolidation challenge that lies ahead and end this decade uh, with a tax system that's more efficient and fairer and better than the one we went into it. But also with regard to um, the COVID challenge and the macroeconomic challenge of that face uh, that, that presents, uh, we're also tackling the question of when when should this happen? If we're going to use uh, this moment to raise a lot of tax and hopefully to improve the tax system, what's the, what should be the timing of that? And we're obviously uh, you know, facing just in the last week or so the prospect of um, you know, further lockdowns and further economic damage from the, uh, from the crisis. So what does that mean about how we, how, we, uh, um, uh, how we time these changes to the tax system and also how they interact with the politics of uh, you know, the next election and uh, intra-party uh, uh, politics? So those are the questions we're going to be kind of covering in our discussion uh, this morning and we've got a fantastic uh, panel uh, to to uh, discuss them with a huge range of experience on 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 all of these questions. So uh, uh, we have Douglas Alexander, who's a senior fellow at Harvard University and uh, former Secretary of State to a number of departments during uh, the last Labour government. Uh, David Gork, who among a number of cabinet roles was also uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and Stephanie Flanders, who is the head of Bloomberg Economics. Uh, so what we'll do, uh, we'll start uh, start off by hearing from Stephanie and then we'll open out to the other panel members. Um, we will hear from our speakers for about the first 20 minutes and then um, we'll move into a Q&A discussion. As we do so, please, as questions arise to you, please just um, uh, put them in the Q&A box and I will come to people to ask their questions uh, directly. Um, and we will wrap up at 11 on the hour. So if uh, with that, I will hand over Stephanie to kick us off. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Ian. We were just talking about whether uh, what we're going to say now will have changed in the last few weeks as we've seen the R naught uh, go up, but I will leave that for, for some of the discussion. I mean, I think if we just put it, given that I'm sort of have a global team at Bloomberg and we have economists who think about these things from a sort of global perspective, it's sometimes helpful to have the context. If you look at the G20 advanced economies as a whole, we're expecting debt as a share of GDP to, on average to rise by about 25 percentage points as a result of this crisis. And that's um, partly the immediate effect of this enormous recession, but also obviously the extraordinary fiscal measures that governments have taken that uh, actually have more or less offset in advanced economies, including the UK. We've done just about enough to directly offset the impact that we expected to have on output. So that's quite unusual. You wouldn't normally um, have been able to act so quickly and have felt able to act with such force. Um, so in that sense, you know, every government, our, our rise is looking like it will be in that ballpark, possibly a bit less, so about 17 or 20% of GDP uh, over the next few years, a step change in our public debt. 
so I guess one point of context to say is to remember is that every government more or less is in the same boat, even if we feel we might have made our vote creakier than others. Um, every government is facing record low borrowing costs and extremely low inflation as far as the eye can see. You know, so we have a, all the factors that we've seen before this crisis keeping interest rate, rates at incredibly low levels. They, if anything, have been increased by this crisis, so there's no sense in which that's going to be reversed in the next couple of years. So you can have a debate about the potential for inflation, but I think that the, the, the general view is rates are going to stay very low. Um, we also have, relatively speaking, uh, quite high maturity debt, which means, uh, and David will understand this well, you know, it means that uh, we are less vulnerable to a big change in rates than many other countries. It would take a long time for that to feed through to actually the cost of servicing our debt because so much of our debt is quite, um, quite old. It's been around for a long time. So I think all of that uh, context plus the risk that we make things a lot worse on the fiscal front by uh, removing stimulus too soon, I think does argue for being extremely careful in timing any move towards consolidation. And I'm sure others will have something to say about that. But I think that I would definitely err on the side of doing too much at this stage. And I would also say that given that there's so much of lack of uh, understanding about the structural damage that's gonna be caused by this crisis, um, to force companies now to make decisions about what the long-term future of their business model is going to be, I think is unhelpful. And I think that feeds into debates you could have about the furlough scheme, if it maybe would be, would it make sense to continue it on a targeted basis, um, on a cost benefit analysis, if you're going to make, increase the scarring from this, from this uh, recession, we all know that means in the end, the fiscal situation will be harder to sustain as well, because you've got lower potential growth and it's potential growth that is the key for uh, on ongoing ability to service the debt. So don't do it, don't force it now, I would say. Um, but I think we are at the stage where you don't have to be shoveling money out of the door without um, a sense of a long-term plan. And I do think if you're gonna do more spending now, it should be in ways that have a long-term objective as well as helping people short-term who've been deeply affected by the crisis. And I think in that context, it's interesting when you think about this, where job creating spending, uh, you need to be doing it in places that across the country that help the younger workers who've been adversely affected, the most affected, um, and potentially have a long-term objective as well. So things like, everyone talks about this, but retrofitting houses to be zero carbon doesn't take a look, easily train up people. I know in Greater Manchester, they're training up young workers who've lost their jobs to do precisely that. You can also have retraining schemes to do social care jobs that don't require a lot of skills. That's important. I think finally, because I know we're going to debate all these things, I think um, if you're just, if you were going to be strategic in thinking about the long-term path of debt and uh, perhaps pre-announcing what your objectives are, even if you're not planning to raise taxes or do any consolidation right yet, I do think you have to send a signal that you're going to be mindful of the way that this crisis has affected the economy. Um, and there's lots of discussion around, you know, we're not going to allow public sector workers to bear the brunt of the consolidation. We're not gonna have a return of austerity. I don't think it's just about that. Um, for one thing, I think people, having seen the spending numbers go up as they have, I think it's gonna be incredibly difficult for any future chief secretary to say, there's no money in the pot because uh, and even when there isn't any money, uh, people will say, well, hang on, you said that last time, but then in fact, you, you know, you met, somehow you pulled 150 billion out of the bag. So I think that the debate is very hard, but you, if you are, when you're making the case for consolidation, you have to show that you're respecting the incredibly unequal way that this crisis has affected households. And I would just point to one thing. I mean, uh, savings have leapt to, in the second quarter of this year, went up from 8% to 21% of income. There was a lot of forced savings. And we know from looking at the stock market, looking at flows into bank accounts, that it's higher income households who have not really seen their income affected have been plowing that into financial assets. You know, you have a big rise in public debt. You've got a big rise. At the other side of that is households buying a lot of public debt, having a new asset coming out of this. So I think one at least, traditionally, economists are the ones who say you should have a wealth tax. 
and politicians are the ones who say yes but have you met any voters who would actually like one um, but I think it would be interesting to see if this is a time it's such a clear example where some households were actively making a lot of money from the crisis at the same time as people were losing their jobs I would be interested to see whether that debate shifts but I'll leave it there because I know there's plenty more to talk about Thanks, Stephanie. And just to come back on your, I mean, as you say, the, the crisis, because it has all sorts of different effects on the supply side and the demand side, and, and we're kind of unclear in which sectors, which problem is going to, is going to bite uh, hardest. But does that mean, what does that mean about, you say we shouldn't be implementing any of these tax rises now, but how will we know, I mean, if structural unemployment is going to be higher to a degree we're kind of unsure about, how would you, what would you, your advice be about how we know when we need to press go on these kind of measures? I mean, I guess part of it is uh, you might know three quarters of the way through the pandemic. Unfortunately, we don't know when three quarters of the pandemic is going to be. I mean, we don't know. Part of the problem is we have no, there's no economic factor which is going to determine the length of this recession um, because it's, it's, it's so also driven by the epidemiology and the handling of the contract and contact and tracing and all of that. So, I mean, that, that's a sort of dodging answer, but I, I think it, you've never, it, you've, it's very rare to have a situation where even if you're doing all your stimulus, all of that could be for nothing. You could still not get a recovery if, we, if people don't have confidence in the contact and trace and don't have, aren't able to get tests and you can't, get, you can't keep your economy going without a, vi without a vaccine. Yeah. Um, but I do think, I, mean, I, I, I would say, you know, I do think, I have sympathy for the Chancellor in saying you can't just have the furlough run and run. I mean, there are clearly people on the furlough who the moment the furlough is over, they will still have a job. Um, but employers are understandably taking the opportunity to get free money from the government. So I think you, if you, it, you should maintain it, but I do think it should be targeted precisely for the reason that you're saying. You have to give, um, make sure that sectors in areas which aren't directly infected are actually having, a, we can see what the shape of them is, we can see how much their demand has really been hit. But something like recreation or hospitality there's, you can't make a judgment now on what the long-term future of the UK mm. hotel industry is. You just you have no idea what, how long-term the effect's going to be. Yeah. It could be stronger because people might be travelling less. Uh, you know, we just have no idea. Yeah. Okay, great. Right, let's move over, David, to you uh, to take it from there. There you are on mute still. I knew I would do that. All right. Um, let me start off with the question of timing, uh, because I, I agree with Stephanie's argument that now is not the time to implement tax increases for all the reasons that she set out. You know, the uncertainty over COVID, uh, the uh, sense that there's still a need for uh, fiscal support to the economy. Um, where I think there is a more interesting debate is, is at what point you need to start announcing uh, that you are going to take measures to put the public finances uh, on a sound footing. Uh, and even accepting the point that interest rates are very low, our debt servicing costs are low, as, as Stephanie has said, uh, a lot of our uh, debt is, is sort of pretty long dated, so uh, we wouldn't be uh, hit by uh, immediate impacts. I think I still think there are some reasons to be concerned in the long term about where we are going to be, because yes, our our, our debt will, our debt to GDP ratio, ratio will be above 100 percent, but our debt servicing costs are low, and all you know, okay, we can manage with that. But if we're not very careful, we're going to continue to see that debt to GDP ratio uh, grow. Um, I think it is hard, in all honesty, to um, see that public spending is going to make a large contribution towards stabilising the public finances. I was part of the Treasury team from, from 2010 to, to 2017, and you know, we obviously focused on uh, public spending. I don't think one can have a repeat of that. Indeed, the, the pressures on public spending, just in the health service alone, are going to be immense. So I think... Um, I think tax will have to bear the greatest burden. When, when do you announce that? Uh, now, we, we don't know the level of scarring, and we don't quite know where the public finances are. So there, there are reasons to hesitate. But I do think there is an argument 
just in terms of a degree of market reassurance, um, you know, we could be in for a very turbulent few months uh, in the context of Brexit. Uh, I do think that there is a case for providing a, a degree of certainty and, and stability. I also think because people think people know that taxes are going up, the, you know, good to give them as much certainty as to which tra taxes are going up and which ones aren't. One of the things that we did in after 2010 was a corporate tax roadmap. And I think that was one of the best things that we did. It didn't get a lot of publicity, but it did provide businesses with a degree of, of certainty and, stab and stability. And I think without something that guides businesses, you, you, you could face um, considerable uncertainty. There, there are downsides with doing this, but I do think sooner rather than later, but I, I stress announcing, not, not necessarily implementing. In, in terms of where we go with all of this, I think the, the first point to say is um, you know, it is going to be imperative to demonstrate that the wealthy make a big contribution, that the, those with the broader shoulders bear the greatest burden. But I think we also have to be realistic. If you are trying to raise 40, 60 billion pounds worth in tax, you are not going to be able to get that from the top 0.1%. Um, it is going to have to be broader based than that, uh, and that is not going to be politically easy. Um, this, uh, 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 the, the, the TBI paper sort of talks about trying to find you know, greater coherence in our tax system, and there clearly are opportunities to make our tax system more coherent. The, the gap between, say, the self-employed and the employed is not justified. Um, it's a long-term threat to the stability of our public finances. You know, our tax base will shrink if we don't do something about it. But you know, I was part of the team that attempted to do something about that in 2017. It is not easy. Um, equally, you know, it would be sensible to broaden our VAT base. I was part of the team that tried to do this in 2012, but that was not uh, easy. Uh, I think there's a, there's a good case for reforming council tax and having new bands of uh, council tax. It would be a progressive thing to do. But you know, again, for various reasons, that will not be straightforward. So it will require some political courage. And I just make um, you know, three political points, if you like, in terms of the political challenges. One, it's hard to rationalise the tax system when you don't have any money. Uh, you, know, you, 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 end up with, you end up with people losing out, you can't compensate them. Um, it's hard to do if you haven't got a bit of money to, to, to sort of at least uh, smooth some of the difficulties. Secondly, you've got a government that has a tax lock in its manifesto, not to increase rates of income tax, national insurance or VAT. It was a mistake when the government of which I was a part did that in 2015. Uh, it's a mistake now. It really does limit the government's ability. I think they would be entirely justified to say COVID has changed things and we need to look at this again. But every indication suggests that the Prime Minister uh, is not going down uh, that route. And the third point I would make is, look, this is a very diverse Conservative Party uh, in the context of economic policy, not very diverse in terms of where they are on Brexit. Uh, but when it comes to economic policy, you have got a wide range of views. You've got the red Tories who are happy with higher taxes on, on the wealthy and they want more spending. You've got populists who want lower taxes and and, and, and higher spending. You've got the, the sort of Reaganites who believe in supply side reform. If you cut taxes, then they'll pay for themselves. You have got fiscal conservatives, traditional fiscal conservatives, which I think is where um, Rishi Sunak is. Um, but it is not a cohesive group that will be comfortable with a tax increase in any particular area. Um, you know, I think it will be a, 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 a real struggle uh, to try and build a consensus within the Conservative Party to deliver uh, all of that. So my conclusion is I think the right thing to do would be to be thinking about sensible tax rises now, preparing the ground. All the, the expectation was that we were going to have a big November budget. I think that might slip now to the spring, um, but I think the government does need to be preparing the ground for some tax rises. They are eventually going to be necessary but let's not underestimate the political challenges uh, 
uh, for Rishi Sunak in trying to deliver sensible tax reform in the years ahead. Thanks, David. And uh, just start, if I could ask you to get into the question of how the politics and the economics um, uh, interact here. I mean, um, obviously, with the resurgence in the virus, the likelihood is that we're going to be way into next year before we see, you know, perhaps unemployment start to fall and, uh, and the economy start to recover fully, um, which means that in terms of implementing taxes, you're probably pushing that uh, quite a long way to the back of the back end of the parliament and you're crashing into uh, an election in, in 2024 um, and I just wonder like what, what if you're looking at this from a political perspective what you know what 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 do you think gives here do you think we end up um, uh, you know you can't really pre-announce things and then go into an election with them but equally just raising taxes on the evil one is not going to work either so so what's the political uh, the likely um, political route out of this do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point about the political cycle and the economic cycle are somewhat misaligned. I mean, if you, if you go back to the, the great financial crash, um, you know, that happened in the autumn of, of 2008. Taxes rose in, in, in January 2011 with the VAT increase. So, you know, you, you, if you're looking at a lag of sort of two, two and a half years, um, well, that's that is on the eve of the general election. I wonder why. I wonder whether that is the reason why Rishi Sunak was pushing so hard to try and increase the taxes sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, one way that he might try to sort of square the circle, if you like, uh, is make some announcements sort of sooner rather than later that both give with the one hand for, in the short term and take away with the other hand in the long term. So you might see an early announcement on, for example, freezing allowances and thresholds in the tax system, mm. which builds up money as you go on, but you can you can legislate for it sooner rather than later. Uh, equally, I'm not particularly a fan of this, um, but you could imagine him announcing increases in corporation tax rates, as well as announcing at the same time uh, a significant short-term uh, increase in the generosity of capital allowances. So, you know, fiscally, it, it looks as if you're supporting the economy in the short term, but by the time you get to 2024, the effect is a tax rise. But you've still got that problem, which is people are feeling that the tax rise is at the wrong point in the cycle. And, and you, know, you almost wonder whether there'll be an attempt to kind of kick the can down the road and, and deal with this in the next parliament, um, I, I think there are risks with that. I think that's not where Rishi Sunak wants to be. Um, but you know, if COVID drags on for a bit longer, if I, you know, as I say, things get pushed back to the spring, um, at that point, you know, and again, if the markets continue to be quite favourable and there aren't the, the pressures that I worry about, um, then you know, then then is it possible that you just try and fudge this until you get through to after twenty twenty four? Yeah. Great, thank you. I guess uh, the, 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 the interaction of these kind of different timing problems make it even more risky that we're going to end up with, with a lot of tactical decisions rather than any strategic ones. Uh, but let's see what we get to. Um, Douglas, let's uh, pass over to you on, 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 on to take it from there. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, let me start with the question that Stephanie and David began with in terms of timing. Maybe just to contextualise, we all know that we experienced a very significant crash in Q1 and Q2, but in Q3, the economy seems to be bouncing back more quickly than, frankly, a lot of commentators expected, recovering about half of the losses from Q1 and Q2. So notwithstanding the concerns expressed on the radio this morning, we're expecting a fairly rapid recovery, but then a plateau. That's what's happened in a number of other countries. And when the recovery slows, we'll have a much clearer idea as to the extent to which our economy is smaller, which in turn will help us more effectively answer the, answer the fiscal sustainability question. So despite some of the aerated headlines that we've read in the Sunday newspapers in recent weeks, I don't judge now or indeed November is the point at which to introduce significant tax rises because tax can't be viewed in isolation from the economy. And as Stephanie pointed out, the economy can't be viewed in isolation from the pandemic. Certainly, we are experiencing that bounce back um, after what Paul Krugman has called a medically induced coma for the global economy. And it feels, therefore, to me that the optimal time to bring in tax changes would be two to three years hence, 
rather than in the next 12 months, when depends on the level of growth and the new equilibrium level of output and demand for more public expenditure. Now, as my Belfer Centre colleague, uh, Graham Allison, has described it, COVID-19 is like a flash of lightning that illuminates the landscape for a moment that allows us to see some of the contours that are obscured by the dark and gives an understanding of the bigger picture. Part of that bigger picture is that British governments have for decades struggled to balance a desire within the British public for Swedish levels of welfare and public service expenditure and US levels of taxation. Part of that bigger picture, of course, is the growing public spending needs of an aging population. Even before we come on to address the point that Stephanie made, the COVID generated pressures for more spending, for example, on health, on social care, welfare, and in wages for those essential workers. And part of that bigger picture is the emergence of new taxable activities, such as the rapid growth and reliance on digital services we've seen over the last six months, and pre-existing threats to existing tax bases, such as fuel duties. And of course, the enduring and clear levels of inequality that the virus has only exposed and exacerbated in the public's mind. All of these factors mean reform of the tax system would be needed even to maintain current levels of spending as a share of GDP, never mind to fill the newly emergent hole. Now, in theory, there should be a degree of agreement on the kind of principles that could underpin that more fundamental reform, sustainability, horizontal equity, procedural fairness, stability, simplicity, transparency. As David wisely observed, those are easy to articulate and incredibly difficult to give expression to. In the real world, in the UK, like every other OECD country, the majority of our tax revenues comes from just those three taxes, income tax, national insurance and VAT. Indeed, in the UK, they account for about two thirds of our entire tax revenue. It's therefore little wonder in my mind that my friend and former colleague Gavin Kelly wrote in the Financial Times before the pandemic that if you want to undertake fundamental tax reform, then it's only for a government with a thumping majority, a zeal for reform, and a taste for battle. Those seem to me to endure pre and post the pandemic. Now, of course, the need for tax reform is clear, a system where whole sections of working people retain less of an extra pound earned than corporate CEOs demands reform. But it seems to me the way to align the economic and political imperatives this autumn is for the Chancellor to level with the public about the scale of the fiscal challenge that we face as a nation, and then actually use the period of the pandemic to engage in a sustained dialogue with the public, aimed at forging a consensus about the kind of tax rises that will follow down the road. The real challenge and the opportunity now, as far as I'm concerned, is to shape the post-crisis common sense. The politics of tax reform needs to precede the policy of tax reform, and therefore now is the opportunity to be shaping and engaging the public's understanding of, frankly, what kind of society we want to be after the pandemic, what kind of economy we want to have after the pandemic, and what the implications are for the tax system. Thanks, Douglas. Um, before I ask a question on that and Labour's role in that, um, Stephanie, did you want to come back on the, on the recovery? It was just a bit of context on that, although uh, Doug has taken us into the, the, the long, I feel sort of uh, feeble uh, going back to the short term. But it, it's interesting. It is true that the economy has come back very fast. But of course, when you have a 20 percentage points decline in the economy, you can come back pretty fast and still have a whopping great hole at the end of it. So I think one of the things that's happened when we look at uh, daily activity numbers, things like all these sort of very high frequency numbers that we're now looking at because the official data is so far behind the reality, um, those actually show uh, activity kind of leveling off in the summer, just as, as uh, Douglas said, the same in Europe. The problem is we were behind, so we should have had an extra six weeks. And in fact, we started leveling off the same time as the continent. So we're sort of 5% in terms of activity, we're running about 5% below the level at which the continent plateaued, and that's before we go into this period. Um, so I think we're still looking at 5 to 10% of GDP kind of missing at the end of this year, which is obviously more than we had in the global financial crisis. I mean, I just wanted to highlight that because it, it speaks to the point we were talking about, what's the structural damage going to be? Because that's so important for this long-term fiscal conversation. 
there really is going to be a lot of clarity and potentially a lot of peril uh, still at the end of this year, a lot to play for, if you like, um, in thinking about what that structural damage could be and trying to limit it. Yeah. Um, and Douglas, in terms of the, if you're looking at this from a Labour Party perspective, I mean, starting that discussion is probably fraught with some uh, political risks for uh, for Labour, um, especially against the Conservative Party that is less uh, fiscally conservative than, than than it used to be. Um, so, so how, what what would you what would your kind of view on the on what Labour's stance should be on this debate and how much it should look to lead it, or you know, what 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 should it what should, what should its line be? I think it's interesting knowing in this part of the discussion where the past is a foreign country. I mean, a kind of um, austerity agenda that we witnessed in the last 10 years definitively seems to be off the Conservative Party's agenda. Um, so in that sense, we're not returning to recent years, but we're also looking at the emergence of a big state conservatism in the UK, a kind of Peronism where you have a large state conservatism in part sustained by a perpetual culture war. And in that sense, that will require new thinking from the Labour Party as to how to orient itself to a party that isn't aspiring in the Conservatives case to be a kind of night watchman neoliberal Thatcherite state. And in that sense, I think that both brings perils and opportunities. The opportunity, as I say, for any opposition is to help shape the common sense as to what the answers to the most pressing questions the country are facing should be. But as Labour, we carry into that debate preconceptions about ourselves, about our motives and about our record. And certainly one of the challenges that we faced going into opposition after 2010 was we were judged not the best advocates for what turned out to be the best policy in the sense that the perception that Labour would say that wouldn't be in terms of more borrowing, more spending actually inhibited our capacity to offer the effective critique of the wrong policy as we feel in relation to austerity. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges for Keir Starmer in terms of repositioning the Labour Party. If people trust your motives, they are more willing to be generous in giving you the benefit of the doubt on policy outcomes. If they don't trust your motives, then ironically, the scope for radical reform shrinks rather than grows. OK, great. Thanks. Um, OK, let's open it up a bit and take a, a set of questions here. Um, uh, Giga Kakad, if I could come to you first. Giga's got a question on uh, on the uh, role of internal Conservative Party politics. So uh, let me just, if I can unmute you here, Giga. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for the um, fantastic uh, contributions. Um, just a quick question. A lot of British politics seems to be dominated by the need to um, manage internal Tory party um, politics. Um, is tax reform going to suffer the same fate or is there hope for a slightly more strategic approach? Lizzie in South, Lizzie I might come to you next because you've got a similar kind of uh, focus in your question. Yeah my question is on uh, some, some similar lines um, and David you talked about kind of uh, the Tory party being quite a broad church in terms of different economic views but I guess the Johnson government is well primed to make um, reforms to the tax system, given that it does have that big majority. And obviously the pandemic kind of, in this world where the pandemic changes everything. But I guess I'm interested to know whether or not you think that actually the Johnson government has a view on how the tax system should function almost before the pandemic and how it might use this opportunity to make, meet that ideology. Um, so far, we've not really seen what that might look like, and it'd be interesting to get a sense from you as to if, if there is a kind of coherent sense at the centre of government as to what they would like to try and achieve on the tax system. David, let's start with you, it's, it's uh, obviously uh, home territory. Yeah, I think um, look, it is always the case that you will have a, a, a range of views within a, a parliamentary party. Uh, I, I think it Economically, the Conservative Party is a broader church now than it has been in, in, in the past. But even at the time I was the, essentially the tax minister, you had you really did have a range of views. It was unlikely that that would necessarily bring together a great deal of coherence. Uh, you would find lots of people who would say they were in favour of tax simplicity, but uh, 
but but that would be a principle they'd be in favour of that wouldn't withstand the first email of complaint about the fact that someone's taxes were going up. Um, and so, you know, it was the sort of thing that you could always win a round of applause in a, a Conservative Party function to say, you know, we need a, we need simpler taxes. Um, but but what that means in practice, when in, with simpler taxes, some people will pay more, um, it didn't really translate. I, I, I don't think uh, I might be doing him an injustice, but I don't think that Boris Johnson is someone who has necessarily thought deeply about the structure of the tax system uh, and has well-developed views as to uh, what it should look like. Um, I, I think Rishi as Chancellor you know, has, has been very impressive and may well have got some uh, you know, thoughts on this, but the political cost of you know, pursuing good policy in tax can be very, very high. And you know, most governments tend to reach the conclusion that it's just not worth the candle, I'm afraid. And you know, it's, frust it's frustrating if you, if you hold strong views about the coherence of the tax system and if you're trying to pursue that as a, as a, as a minister. But you know, I look at all the times when you know, we ran into real problems um, in my time in the Treasury. It was when we were trying to do what most tax experts thought was the right thing. Um, so so I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic, I'm afraid. OK, uh, Douglas, do you, I don't know whether you want to comment as from an outside perspective on, on that. Um, I think David was characteristically gracious in observing that he wasn't entirely clear whether Boris Johnson had thought deeply about the tax system. It does seem to me there's an emerging tension between Boris Johnson not wanting to alienate restive members of parliament with too many tax rises, while one would imagine Rishni Sunak wants to retain credibility in the markets. I saw a comment from Rishni Sunak just a couple of weeks ago to Conservative MPs, where he said it won't be a horror show with no end in sight. So clearly, if he is contemplating tax rises, perfectly reasonably, Rishni Sunak already is thinking how do we try and better align the economic and the electoral cycles? I suppose we're all a product of our biography on this panel. I look back on the tax rise, the national insurance rise that Gordon Brown implemented for the health service early in his time as chancellor. And that seems to me to be the archetype of how to get tax reform right, even a straightforward tax change, because we really had been working at that for three years preceding the measure being introduced. And that was the point I was trying to draw out in my earlier remarks, which is if you don't roll the pitch, if you don't prepare a public consensus before a radical measure, if, um, if you like, you turn up in the chamber as the chancellor with a spreadsheet saying this is a rational economic choice, it's like turning up for a knife fight with a teaspoon. That the reality is you need to have established a political foundation on which to implement policy radicalism. And in that sense, I genuinely don't think we know what the appetite of this government is for that kind of radicalism quite yet, partly because of the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, it seemed to me that the judgment had been made that they wanted to differentiate themselves with respect from the government of which David was part, the preceding coalition government and Theresa May's government, significantly increase capital expenditure, talk about the levelling up agenda, but critically do as much as they could without raising taxes. And actually, for all of the reasons that Stephanie set out, going to have a smaller economy, additional costs of the pandemic, hard choices are now being forced upon them. It's unclear whether they're going to grasp that nettle and go for more radical reform and do the hard yards of political work to establish it, or whether they will try and dodge that challenge and instead just look for ways to find the income that they need. Um, Doug, in terms of pitch rolling, you, you, that kind of links up with something you, know, you were saying earlier, David, about the need to at least uh, sort of pre-announce or indicate the direction of travel here. Um, but I just wonder whether we're in a slightly different um, political environment now where um, the, the risk is that if you try and do any of that, you, just fa you will face a, a lot of years of you know, coordinated opposition to whatever plans you're hoping to put in place making it therefore much more difficult to uh, deliver. So I, I can sort of see the argument running both ways, that if you, if you, if you, try, yeah. and, if you try and set out too much, then you're, you're just putting a target up to be shot at. So, so what, you know, how, you know, which of these is the right way to go, or is there a way, way to balance these problems? 
I think you're right. I think we're in a kind of national roadrunner moment where we've gone off the cliff, the legs are still moving and people know that change is coming. I suppose that the difference that I would probably establish between myself and David's position, he made an eloquent case for policy pitch rolling. I would make the case for political pitch rolling. I actually think the challenge now is for the Chancellor to be talking to the country about the scale of the fiscal challenge, the reality of the economy post pandemic, and how a tax system needs to support not just public services and public expenditure, but growth and innovation going forward, but not be as prescriptive as, for example, setting tram lines for corporation tax. So, so my answer to try and resolve the dilemma you identify would actually be to pitch roll on the politics of tax reform rather than the specific policy reforms at this stage. Stephanie, did you want to come in on that? Yes, I just was saying, I mean, I think the other, you say, you know, what's the trade-off between the short and the long-term, I mean, having a long-term debate which you never win versus uh, doing something which is, gets, gets killed off instantly. I mean, I do, just going back to this point, I think there could be, along with a strategic vision, if we think that that's possible to get that out of the, the government in this environment, um, there is a, some scope for opportunism, and we had sort of windfall uh, levies and other things early in the, the Labour parliaments in the past and indeed in the, under uh, Margaret Thatcher. But I, I think if there's something that explicitly speaks to what happened in the last six months and who benefited, actually benefited from the crisis, you know, this is a very unusual recession. I mean, actually the last crisis, there was a certain amount of everyone sharing the pain because of the way that we didn't see a big rise in unemployment. And of course, it was unequally distributed in general sense, but it wasn't as unequal as this. The fact that some people have benefited, I think, could resonate with people if you're talking about a short term, a one off tax. So, for example, some form of wealth tax that you said was a three year COVID tax um, that would be a bridge to some longer term strategic change that would probably come after an election. Um, but I think there could be scope for that kind of opportunism that, to, that if you would make the case, and I can see Boris even saying, you know, wanting to sort of seize the moment that speaks to what happened this year specifically and doesn't get you into big debates about the rights and wrongs of the system before. But uh, Stephanie, on that, I mean, you're, the, the, mo most of the challenge we're seeing is a kind of a structural shortfall in the deficit. In, 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 in the, in the deficit. So, you know, it, how much of a role do you think there is for that kind of one-off windfall well, type? That's, I think partly it would be symbolic because you're saying we understand, you know, we, the Conservative Party, who'd have historically not been alive to this, are very alive to this. Um, but as I said, it could be a bridge out through that political, you know, the life is never this neat. But at some level, it could be a bridge to those longer reforms. If we think there has to be tax rises with this side of the election, but it's going to be very hard to do that in a sort of strategic, sensible right. way. This could inject some, you could have some money and you've also actually maybe gained some fans. You know, on that levelling up, if you're trying to keep those voters who, who voted for Tories for the first time, um, this could help keep them on board um, without completely blowing up the Conservative Party, potentially. Yeah, great. OK, uh, David, did you want to come in on that? It, just a couple of things. I mean, one Douglas, I think, makes a very good case for the political argument for um, uh, you know the country recognizing that taxes are going to have to increase. Um, I think his example of the national insurance uh, increase is a very good one, uh, and that was an example of how you really roll the pitch. I, I think, to some extent, the fiscal well, actually to a great extent, I think the fiscal consolidation that was pursued after twenty ten, yeah, you know, that was followed after a, you know a, a long argument about how that was going to be necessary. Um, what well, not necessarily setting out what the details were, but 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 setting out how that was how that was how that was going to be um, necessary. Um, but I do think that um, you know maybe the autumn particularly given where we are with covid is, is about doing that but i think probably as we get into next year there is something to be said for saying and this is actually how we're going to do it and uh, moving relatively quickly in terms of announcing and legislating but not implementing partly for the point you raised earlier in about the um uh, the fiscal the, the 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 timing and the electoral cycle 
Uh, I just make one other point about on Stephanie's uh, suggestion in terms of kind of one-off wealth taxes, and I can absolutely, you know, hear that argument being made. But our fiscal problem isn't, you know, the, actually that the debt levels have gone up as as much as as they have. We can probably live with that. Is the fact that they're likely to continue to rise once we're through that. So. I, I think, you know, if it's a structural problem, then one-off taxes, you know, it might lower your starting base in terms of your debt to GDP ratio, but it doesn't, doesn't really solve your problem. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and personally, I think, you know, much so I can see the, the argument for a wealth tax, I think politically um, pulling together one big tax that incorporates everything, what's included, what's not included, how you're going to assess this and so on. It's going to take years to get it up and running. And I think if I was the government, I'd be looking at the constituent parts of wealth, you know, whether that's property or whether that's um, shares. And, you know, would you look at the sort of dividend rate of uh, income tax and, and, and try and deal with it that way rather than all encompassing uh, wealth tax that I think will just in the end prove to be too difficult. And I do. I, I take the, all those points and you're, you're right from a, from a planning perspective, but I would say some of those become less pressing concerns if it's a short term tax. And again, it was just this point about if we really don't think you're going to be able to do the big strategic questions for all the reasons that you suggested, this could um, get you to the election, but also provide a bit of money to your point about needing to have something to grease the wheels of these kind of reforms. Mm -hmm. It could inject a bit of money, but I totally accept so, and, and you're not if it's a short term thing, then you, you're reducing, you're not getting rid of it, but you're reducing the avoidance incentive because people aren't thinking, OK, this is forever. This is going to be a wealth. But I take all of those points. Yeah, I guess I would say make one other point on that, which is I think the digital services tax also falls into the category of taxes that make more sense during and post a pandemic. But it's, again, a good example of where politics is intruding. The government seems to be stepping back from a digital services tax in relation to the possibility of a trade deal with the US, I have to say my sense as to the probability of that trade deal with the US declines almost every day with every tweet from Joe Biden, never mind from um, uh, Nancy Pelosi. So in that sense, the digital services tax seems to me to be an example of a tax which is an area of the economy that everybody recognises has actually differentially benefited from the experience of the last six months, that has historically been significantly undertaxed, and yet it's an example where we seem to be moving away from rationality rather than towards rationality if it's actually being discounted. Now, just to dwell on this wealth uh, tax issue for a minute, um, Aaron Advani has asked the question, Aaron's uh, leading a wealth tax project at Warwick University and the, and the LSE. Um, Aaron, do you want to comment on, on, on what you've heard so far, press any, any of the panellists on this? Uh, yeah, so I, I, thanks for uh, all of the comments and uh, discussion. I was just going to ask a bit more about the uh, idea of a wealth tax, both the possibility of a one-off or of a, I mean, to, to the point of could a one-off wealth tax help and it's not solving a structural problem, then, then the alternative is do you look towards a longer-term wealth tax? Uh, that sort of stays in place. But I think the sort of trade-off here is, on the one hand, being able to bring in something like that is sort of bringing in a new base that we haven't had covered by uh, the tax system before in a sort of comprehensive way. I think the trade-off compared to the suggestion made um, about sort of just focusing on particular components is firstly, we know from uh, foreign uh, evidence uh, of, the, of those kind of versions of a wealth tax that you see a lot more avoidance when you have the ability to only cover certain assets and so people switch a lot. Uh, but the other is mm. you then only capture people who have particularly high sort of levels of income from certain kinds of wealth, whereas sometimes the discussion is really, are there sources of wealth that we know people have that aren't actually receiving huge amounts of income right now? It's mostly gains uh, it's often that aren't realized or are realized at death, and so they're not taxed at the moment. And so there's a case for if you're going to have a wealth tax, actually really focusing on the base rather than the income for it, because you're capturing sort of uh, wealth that's otherwise not being taxed as heavily. Um, Stephanie, do you want to... I mean, I think that actually that goes to what David was saying about all the things that you would think about. I mean, again, and I'm not wedded to this. Um, I have no great scheme for a, for a one-off thing. I would just think it's an, an idea. but And it has been proposed at a European level as one response for raising money. But I, I do think, again, it could help you know, in the best of all worlds, which we're not living in, but in a, there is a world in which it would set a precedent 
and then you do a much better version thinking about the way that wealth is taxed in all the ways that David's talked about, you know, wh where, how do people hold their wealth? What is a sensible way? You know, again, the issue of, of property taxation, but none of that is going to be, be going to be able to touch it before the election. But it is possible if we had had one example that actually was perceived to have worked at some level and to have a kind of rough justice to it, it might actually open the way to that, to a debate about a more sensible way of doing it. Does anybody else want to pitch in again on wealth? David, go on. Well, I, I won't repeat what I, I, I said earlier about why, why I have um, a few reservations. One <laughs> is why I, I, I don't think they'll go down that route. I, I could be wrong. It, it is, is, is in a way built on what Stephanie was saying, which is if, if a Conservative government does go down this route, and even if it's a bit rough and ready, and it takes a while to come in, and even if it's sort of temporary, you have then got something which um, a Labour government could then use much more extensively. Now, that may or may not be a good thing, um, but I think a Conservative government would be very nervous about going down this route as a consequence of this. And just one other point to add, you know, the lag between making an announcement um, and implementing it, I think is, you know, it would be so considerable because you've, you know, you've, got, you've, got, to, you've got to legislate, you've got to assess uh, assets, um, you've got all sorts of problems about how do you, how do you deal with the hard cases, the, the, you know, the property rich, cash poor, et cetera, et cetera. That is a long period of political vulnerability. Um, for complaints from um, you know, the parliamentary party, from the donors, if you start to see behavioural change and you know, wealthy people moving out of the country. It doesn't poll very well, even amongst people who, don't, who are never, ever going to pay it. Um, so you know, if you want, you know, my prediction is that they won't go down that, that, that route. I, I, you know, I can hear all the arguments for it, but I don't think they'll do it. Uh, and by the way, if you want a radical tax reform that I think is in the long term more feasible and more interesting, I, I, I think a conversation about a progressive consumption tax would be quite interesting. Yeah, interesting. OK, great. Look, we've got um, a few minutes left. There's a lot of questions about specific types of specific taxes, which I don't want to get too into the weeds on. So um, but one, one area that I think we <laughs> It's possibly worth making an exception on that front is to think about uh, environmental taxes and uh, and particularly with the you know, some uh, pretty bad news on the climate front uh, in the news even competing with uh, COVID and Brexit at the moment uh, so things are pretty bad we have COP26 next year the UK needs to show leadership on this front if at a time when you need to raise 60 billion uh, pounds you are not thinking about looking at this as a, a lens to, to consider how to reform the tax system then there's got to be something wrong or when are you going to look at it so um there's a question here from steve coulter steve is asking about this uh steve if i unmute you do you want to ask your question yeah thanks uh thanks for a very interesting discussion yeah so um as ian said um carbon taxes so um slightly different kind of taxes because it's not really designed necessarily to raise revenue and balance budgets, but it's very, very important um, for the environment. And actually, it could end up raising a fair bit of revenue, some of which you could um, use to compensate some of the losers from this. So if you increase um, petrol taxes, you can put some of the money into compensating um, people on low incomes, subsidizing uh, rural transport. So um, I wonder what the sort of views on this are. And let me start by being generous to the government. I think the fact that they delayed COP26 from this November to next November actually is a sign of high ambition, not low ambition. We're all spending our life on Zoom calls. It would have been perfectly easy to have a virtual COP26 and it would have delivered low outcomes in terms of nationally determined contributions. So I think that we've got an opportunity in the next 12 or 14 months to actually raise people's expectations about what the Glasgow Conference can achieve. I think the point that was made in terms of the principal objective of a carbon tax not being revenue generation doesn't mitigate the fact that it may have a significant role to play in terms of a broader package. I know that Europe's giving serious thought to it at the moment, but I think there's one other point, which is given the scale of public expenditure that we're witnessing at the moment, I think it is imperative that we have an environmental consideration for the public expenditure that's happened. 
given, frankly, not just the point that Stephanie made in terms of insulation in the future, but the degree of public support and subsidy that may be needed by British businesses in the next 12 to 18 to 24 months, we should be thinking about conditionalities. Any public money should now have conditionalities attached. Basically, the airline industry is effectively bust as a consequence of this. Do we want to return to the kind of flying and the kind of aircraft that we had in January of 2020? Or should there be environmental or energy conditions set for public support at this time? That feels to me to be a critical COVID created lever that's available to us that simply wouldn't have been but for the crisis. Uh, but Douglas, so to clarify on that, you you don't you essentially don't see green taxes as as a revenue as a significant revenue raiser. The, your view is that we need to be much more micro about that. Okay. No, I see I see carbon taxes certainly pre-COP26 in terms of the contribution as being a, a contribution to getting to nationally determined contributions that are appropriate for the science. Over the longer term, do we want to see a tax on those kind of externalities that are having such a damaging effect on the, on the planet? Of course we do, but that's not probably a work for the next 12 to 18 months, given everything else that we're coping with. Uh, Stephanie, David, do either of you, you want to come in? I, I mean, ju just on that, look, I think it, 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 it does make sense to um, shift taxes in that direction. You know, I think it was Geoffrey Howe who came up with the phrase, you know, pay as you burn rather than pay as you earn. Uh, and what we currently have is incoherent. And I think this is a classic area where uh, I, I would see this as a sort of longer term thing. Um, this is a classic area where you, you do sort of set out which are the bits that are relatively undertaxed, which are the bits that are perhaps relatively overtaxed and try and bring a degree of coherence to it. But again, let's not underestimate you know, the, 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 These are taxes that will be paid by people um, yes, you can compensate the poorest. Yes, you can improve rural bus services and so on. But, you know, fundamentally, these, these are you know, tax increases that lots of people will have to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, a sensible system, actually, we would be increasing VAT on domestic fuel. Um, the political pressures are probably to reduce it. Vote Leave promised that they would reduce it. So, um, you know, I think trying to sort of set out what is the objective, set out where the tax system is incoherent at the moment and move in an area where we... Yeah, we we tax carbon in a consistent way would make a would make a huge amount of sense. Stephanie, do you want to comment comment on that, or shall I give you one last question? I think every, everyone has said uh, sensible things. I mean, I do think. I mean, actually, Douglas was tied to this earlier that, that right now we are there are certain some of the key parts of the um, economy that produce that um, are environmentally costly are taxed relatively highly. And if we're going to move, for example, to electric cars, there's actually a threat to our fuel duty and other things mm. that comes from that. So I think, so I would agree that um, it, sh it can't really be a big revenue raiser. It's, it's a very different conversation than you would have, for example, in the US, where there's obviously uh, a long way to go in taxing carbon. Okay, it's just more about the structure. Are you, sens are you being sensible, as David said? Are you actually being consistent in the way you tax it? And are you implicitly subsidising it in one part of the economy while taxing it very heavily in another, which is clearly the case? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, look, um, we, we've got just a minute left. I just wanted to chuck one more uh, thing in to, in to ask you about as we close. And that's that, you know, we, we, we sort of have a benchmark from the OBR in terms of this £60 billion pound hole, which may or may not turn out to be the right number, but take it uh, as given that, that that's what we're sort of looking at here. Uh, David said, you know, this is largely going to have to be done with tax. Um, but of course, this is a somewhat technocratic discussion about getting back to previous um, deficit levels and, and, and that sort of thing. And of course, there's a whole debate around the, the resilience of the state and, you know, the, the challenges this has thrown up in terms of political pressure to fund social care more urgently, to make sure the NHS is better funded. And we're already facing, you know, a situation where the NHS is kind of cannibalising the budgets of other departments anyway so i just wanted to get a sense of, a sense from you as we close like is the scale of the challenge actually quite a lot bigger than whatever the kind of uh technocratic number crunches might say uh and does that all have to be uh done with tax does anybody want to have a go at that and give us any last thoughts before we close my personal view is yes i think the state needs to be larger than it is today and the extent to which it was hollowed out pre-crisis I think will be one of the defining issues of politics in the next five years. Almost regardless of the choices that Rishni Sunak and, and Boris Johnson make, 
I would wager a small amount of money that the Labour Shadow Chancellor and Labour leader in three or four years' time will say, actually, we didn't fix, or this government didn't fix the roof when the sun was shining. We were left more vulnerable when the crisis hit because of the decade that preceded the crisis. That will be the very stuff of politics. Whether Labour prevails in that point of view, I think will be a big determinant of what size of state we actually see in the years ahead. Great, thank you. David, do you uh, want to get next? Yeah, I, was just, I, I, I think even pre-COVID, the, the, the pressures on public spending were, were immense, and I think the shift in public opinion was in the direction of a, of a larger state and a sense that the priority was strengthening public services rather than cutting taxes. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that's entirely justified. What I would say is that as we enter into a period of uh, you know, increasing taxes uh, eventually, you know, we should not forget there are some taxes that are more damaging to economic growth than others. There are some that are a disincentive to investment. Uh, there are some that can, you know, some that can make us less dynamic and competitive. You know, some some tax rises are uh, better than others, and that when we increase taxes, and I think it is a matter of when, you know, we do need to bear in mind that the UK is still going to have to be you know, a, a competitive pro-enterprise country. And, and, and that makes it all the harder, but, but you know, if we're going to succeed as a country, we are still going to have to, you know, bear in mind it's, it's you know, you can, you can damage the economy by increasing taxes. You need to be careful how you do it. But David, if we get the right taxes, should we go above 60 billion? Um, we might, we might well be. I think, look, Ian, it's really hard to know what those numbers are. Depends on the scarring, but look, there are considerable pressures on public spending. There's no doubt about it. Additional pressures because of COVID. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's going to be a sizable sum. But, you know, I think if you look at the Scandinavians, they've been quite, they've been successful and still having you know, open dynamic economies uh, mm. with a high tax base. But you can also look at plenty of other examples. And frankly, the UK in the 1970s is a very good example where high taxes you know, made us uncompetitive, undynamic, was a disincentive uh, to, to enterprise. And you know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that side of things as well. Stephanie, final word to you. A smile when I think of, uh, you know, should we go above the 60 billion? Well, let's get the 60 billion first and then see, see, see how we, we think. I mean, I agree that I think the state's going to be bigger. I think we should remember that our tax ratio, what are we at? 34% of GDP is, is lower than um, most, of, uh, most of Europe. And certainly this government seems to have less problem with that, what Douglas was talking about, the inherent public desire for more Swedish style um, spending. But I mean, not to be a broken record on this, I do think there will be a debate, especially as we see the pandemic. The other thing we haven't mentioned that's been accelerated by the pandemic almost certainly is automation and the impact that that might have on the labour market. I think this debate, whether it's wealth taxes or anything else, the debate about the relative taxation of labour versus capital is going to be a global one. And we should think about it quite hard. For example, whether we should, one of your, one of the questions raised, you know, should we be equalising capital gains tax rate and income tax. That is a very big debate. We can talk about disincentive effects, but that is coming globally. And I don't think we can just keep applying the same furrow when it comes to tax options. Great, thank you all. And uh, uh, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. I know we're a few minutes over, but I did think it was worth getting that uh, final question in. Um, look, thanks to our panelists. Do look out for a publication we've got coming down the track, hopefully ahead of the uh, budget if it, if it happens. Um, but certainly this autumn we'll be putting out a publication that looks at uh, what the principles should be that we uh, that we uh, work off uh, to create a more strategic approach to what needs to happen to tax over the next decade. Uh, please also look out for our uh, events website. We've got another event in two weeks time on local government finance. So do join us uh, for that. Um, but uh, for now, thank you to, to David, to Douglas and to Stephanie for an excellent discussion. And I hope you all have a good day. Thank you.